Thank you again for coming to Hongpa Honganji Hawaii Bet Sin for the Wisdom and Compassion at End of Life Care, a Buddhist symposium. Uh, sorry, uh, we didn't expect uh, so many people for today, uh, for this weekend session. The committee had to close the registration when the number 130 reached. And the committee knows that there are about 40 people on the waiting list. So we are making all kinds of adjustments, but uh, we are not meeting the needs of the participants yet. So please be patient with us for a while. Now, the, uh, today's uh, first session is a keynote addressed by Dr. Carl Becker. It was supposed to be in the Annex Temple, but we moved here. I hope it's okay for all of you. Uh, Dr. Becker uh, is a graduate of uh, UH uh, philosophy department, religion department, and uh, he received a doctorate, uh, and uh, he, he is now a professor of uh, Kokoro Research Center of uh, Kyoto University. I think he was the first uh, U.S. Uh, citizen who uh, received the uh, position of uh, professor at uh, National University. So he's a very unique person. And for the past uh, several years, he is making researches, conferences, and uh, symposium in the area of end-of-life care and the spiritual needs. His interest is in Buddha Dharma, and uh, we feel very grateful for, uh, to him for his uh, uh, visit uh, this time. We are very happy to have uh, with us Dr. K Becker for the keynote address. Would you welcome Dr. Becker with a round of applause? for sound. Can you hear me? Okay, let's get the computer up and running. I normally spend all day on a death and dying end of life workshop. They tell me I have 43 minutes today, <laughs> so it's going to be very compressed. I have no special wisdom. I want to thank first my teachers, including people like Ralph Honda, Al Miyasato, Baron Goto, and people here in this room like Rose Nakamura. And all of you are my teachers because we're all growing together. It's not like somebody's got all the wisdom, especially when we're caring for old people. They have the wisdom that we need to learn each step of the way. Japanese don't wear religion on their sleeve. They don't preach religion, but they do have many deeply religious experiences, which I will point in three dimensions. The inner self, the outer world, interconnectedness, and invisible world. Let me give you some examples from people I've talked to. People all around the world drink tea. But in Japan, we drink tea not just to add to our water supply, but to carve that taste and moment and all the people and feelings of that moment into our hearts. And the ability to take an everyday moment and make it into a special moment is something we can all learn in our lives. So that just being here becomes being here. Just being together becomes being together. It's easier said than done. Quotes from Japanese. Feeling discipline and relation to an inner self 
like I feel my utter impermanence and aloneness. I polish my heart by martial arts and embuts. I keep my promises to my departed mother. And this is Ohigang. I purify myself every morning and night after uncleanness or anything dirty. That's one dimension, the inside. Dimension number two is feeling interconnected, interdependent to each other and nature. Like I feel totally at one and at peace with the sunrise or the mountains, the night sky, the sea, whatever. I know my mother's or my sister's thoughts before she says them. I know when somebody is calling or texting me before I even get the text message. I can feel people gazing at my back. Sure enough, they're looking at me. And I know when my friends are in trouble or have premonitions before I meet them. Now, some people would say, that's superstition. That's not superstition. Feeling interconnected, knowing when your loved ones are thinking about you, feeling when they need you, what could be more important than that? If we've thrown that out of our education, we've thrown out the most important part, spiritual interconnectedness. And that's what religion is all about, that we are connected on a spiritual level. And one more level is related to the invisible world. One man says, when I live rightly and I'm in need of rice, it comes to me unexpectedly. And this was very important in the, uh, a year ago when a lot of people were out of rice. Another one says, I have the same dreams as my brother and wonder why my parents did not. I consult my ancestors when I'm in trouble. I'll talk more about that later. Or the shaman spoke in the voice of my grandpa. And that's a beautiful story, but I don't have time in 43 minutes. So Japanese are aware of other dimensions, that it's not all just here and what meets the eye. Look at the face of this old lady. When I have seen people passing away and looking off into another space, she's been in pain for a long time, but she's seeing something that we can't see. And like I said last night, instead of being sad that she's not with me 100%, I can be happy that she's taken the effort to stay with us a little bit longer, and at the same time that she is already experiencing part of another world that I don't see yet. We can thank and welcome their half presence. And caring for elders and seeing them off to the Pure Land, is this just cultural baggage? Are we going to graduate from this when we get real American? I hope not. But how does this connect to Buddhism? For starters, as we heard last night, if there's no life after, Buddhism, if there's no life after death, there's no Buddhism. Because life is tough. Life is rough. If I thought this was all that existed, I'd be dead a long time ago, because I don't like it here all the time. But if I know that there is more to come, then this is just like grade school before going to high school, and I better finish my grade school assignment before I go to high school. And as we also heard last night, there are two kinds of Buddhism. One kind, the Theravada says, you've got to do it yourself. Nobody help you out. You meditate. Your last thought at the moment of death, that signs you up for your next assignment. And if your last thoughts are not right, tough luck, do it over. Flunk out. But another kind of Buddhism says, it's called Mahayana, and inside the Mahayana we have the Pure Land, and it says there are wonderful, invisible powers who have already understood the universe and are reaching down to help us out. We call them bodhisattvas. Well, how do you know there's one bodhisattva? Amida? Who he? That's what I first said 40 years ago when I came here, the first time 40 years ago. Who's he? Well, Amita means a contraction of Amitayus, which is infinite light, excuse me, infinite life. You all alive, I'm alive, we all got life, but we all just one little point, one little speck compared to infinite life that we participate in. Light, we all like light. We got light coming into the hall right now. 
But this little bitty light in the hole is nothing compared to the total infinite light of the universe. And light is a metaphor for wisdom. It also names the warm, welcoming light that greets dying people at their deathbeds. And this fact has been recorded for thousands of years in the Buddhist sutras, in meditation, in Japanese deathbed records, and even now in modern hospitals. Let's see. Here's a Chinese painting. Indian and Chinese meditators found that they could experience infinite light and life in meditation. The Chinese meditator is here, and in his mind, he's going through to the world of infinite wisdom, light, and life we call Amida's world, the pure land. Some of us can't do that. But scrolls and records like this show that visions reported by ordinary people, not only priests, but everyday folks who don't meditate, but simply chant, expecting Amida's welcome, see Amida, a beautiful light, when they pass. I can't show you the whole scroll because it's real long. You know how the Japanese scroll go about 30 feet long. But this is Benne. He was a disciple of Honen Shonin. And he passed away in his black robes. The monks around him are crying, broken down. Their master is dead. But he's smiling. And this golden tube light shows he's connected to what we saw on the former slide, Amida, the realm of light. But is this all ancient history? Universities today are studying this. Connecticut, Oxford, Utrecht, and Holland. I was just sent a student there. Virginia Medical School, Wales. What did they find? My friend Mike Sabum, who's a famous cardiologist in Atlanta, Georgia, operated on Pam Reynolds, the rock singer. She had a tumor in her brain the size of a tennis ball. She's going to die. The only way to take out a tumor that size is using technology that Japanese invented. Yay. What you do is you drain all the blood out of the brain, so the brain is not functioning. You cool down the body to about 60 degrees, so it's not functioning much. It's kind of in refrigeration. You cover the eyes and all the senses so they don't have any awareness. And then you cut open the head, take out the tumor put it back together, warm up the body, and put the blood back in. And it's only then that the brain starts working again. Well, Pam Reynolds was one such case. And when there was no blood in her brain, her brain was totally out of it. She remembered drifting up above her operation, and she remembered every bit of the operation correctly, including a lot of stuff that isn't in the textbooks. In Utrecht. Dutch physician Pim van Lump has studied patients with flat EEGs and ECGs. That means their brain's flat, the heart's flat, no reflexes, they are dead. But when they were dead, not when they were dead, after they came back from being resuscitated, they reported reason, emotion, identity, clear consciousness that we couldn't see, but they could see us. Now, where is this? Lancet, you know the Lancet? Lancet is like one of the two or three leading medical journals in the whole world. Medical journal says, this is how it is. Uh, this is a long book I wrote. I won't give you the full story. But when this boy was hit by a car getting off of his school bus, his brain was basically knocked out of the brain case. He was gone for 49 days. And that has a special significance if you're Buddhist. And when he came back, he reported going through a tunnel to a beautiful land of light. And who met him there was not the Buddha Amida, but this old guy. And this old guy said, are you Kisak? Kisak is his father's name. He said, no, I'm not Kisak. Are you Takuro? He says, yeah, I'm Takuro. Get out of here, Takuro. You don't belong here. You're too young for here. So Takuro doesn't want to go back to his body. It's all bashed up and the brain out of the brain case. So he plays hide-and-go-seek with his old man behind a rock, behind some flowers. 
and the old man comes and says, Takuro, go home, Takuro, go home. So finally, Takuro goes home to his body in the hospital, and he describes this old man, how tall he was, his face, his whole gang, his, his dialect, his, his habits, and his mother, Takuro's mother, goes white. She says, that's not your granddad. That's my granddad. You never met him. And she gets an old family picture with lots and lots of family folks and shows to Takuro in the hospital. And immediately, he points, he says, Anujijia. It was that, that's the guy. But when I saw him, he didn't have those thick glasses on. Because when everybody gets the Pure Land, we all see perfectly, right? <laughs> How could Takuro know the dialect and the height and the walking patterns of his great-grandfather who died before he was born. His great-grandfather is there somewhere. And this is not isolated, but common. In the Resuscitation Journal, another major medical journal, Dr. Sam Parnia of Southampton Hospital in England says he's found more than 3,500 patients with clear memories, including ready for this, figures of light that occurred when they were clinically dead. When Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and Ray Moody and Mike Sabum and people like myself 40 years ago started studying this stuff, we had to invent the word figure of light because so many people are experiencing a figure of light at their deathbed. And it wasn't until I started coming to Hongaji I realized, hey, Japanese knew about this for 1,200 years. Chinese knew about this for 2,000 years. It's nothing new. It's universal. But it still goes on, whether you believe in it or not, whether you call it Amida or not. So Amida is the figure of light who appears to greet dying people, but it's just an image of a much greater light of wisdom and life. So what's the message? The true dying people widely experience compassionate light we can call Amida. Death does not end conscious life. Life continues in a different dimension, like Takuro's granddad, great-granddad. But Japanese knew this for centuries. What's the big deal? The big deal is this understanding should affect the way we work with dying people and with bereaved people. Dying people are worried. Where am I going? What's going to happen to me? What's next? And if we know what I just explained, that there is more, and you do meet your ancestors, and an incredible power of light and life and compassion comes to welcome you, then death is not to be afraid. Fear means what you don't know, right? When you say, I'm afraid of that test, it's because you don't know what's on the test. If you're afraid of the interview, it's because you don't know what's in the interview. When you're right there, you're not afraid anymore because it's happening. Fear means ignorance. And when you know, then you're not ignorant, and then you're not afraid. This is a famous photo by Ernie Pyle, the guy who died in Iwo Jima. But he shot this doctor after all-night surgery that failed. Let me clue you. Fighting death usually fails. Death always wins in the long term. And this doctor is totally exhausted. You can see the sense of defeat in his face. Why is he defeated? Because he thinks the body is all you got. And if you lose the body, you lose the person. But if you realize the real you is not just your body, but is your heart, your spirit, your soul, your mind inside. And that, the real you, is going on. Of course, we try to keep your body as healthy as you can be. But it's not a defeat for the body to die. This happens to everybody. Feudal treatment. Lots of hospitals push people. You need this medicine, you need that. You need your throat cut open for one respirator. You need a pacemaker. You need this, that. You need a transplant because they're trying to save the body. But if we understand that body is only one part of life, then 
Instead of Dabemotode, against the odds, trying to pour more and more money and time on somebody who wants to pass naturally anyway, we can decide different places to cut that off. And the church doesn't tell us, you stop here. That's each family's decision. But we don't have to struggle as if the body's all we got. One of the professions I respect most in the world, sorry guys, even more than ministers, is nurses who work with terminal patients. It's hard enough to work with as a nurse, but when you're working with a terminal patient, I don't even have nurse credentials, but sometimes I take their shit and wipe down their bodies and sit with them as they're dying, and it's hard. And your feelings go out to them. You want them to be happier and healthier and live longer, and the next day you go there and they're gone. And all that sweat and tears you poured into them, it feels like a punch in the jaw or a big empty hole opens up where they used to be. And if you have to do this every week, and one day you're taking the, the, what do you call it in English, mucus out of the throat of the dying patient, and the next day you're making up the bed for the next person, it's easy to burn out. Much of my research now and my workshops in Japan or working with these nurses to try to prevent burnout. But what's the biggest thing to prevent burnout is to realize it's not all in the body. We are just giving them one send off. We can no longer see them when their boat goes over the horizon, but it doesn't mean their boat stops sailing. It just means they're in a different part of the ocean. Costly medical lawsuits. I did research on lawsuits in Japan a few years ago and found out that most of the lawsuits against hospitals who had lost patients, the hospital was not at fault. Why did the lawsuit happen? Because the people who lost a loved one could not accept death. And they were angry, so they had to find the bad guy, had to find a villain to blame for death, but nobody's to blame for death. The doctors are doing their best, learning to to take what comes. It's easy to say, but hard to do, especially when you love someone very much and they leave you. But if we can understand this, then we can reduce lawsuits. And lawsuits cost everybody. They cost tax money. They cost time and effort. One year ago, look at her face. The wife of a fisherman, she's a good swimmer. The water, no, it's not water, it's mud. You see them in TV, the, a wall of black mud washing over in that tsunami. Because she's a good swimmer, she dive into the mud and found her daughter's body, pull them out and try to revive it. Now, if it's pure water, salt water, you can pump it out of the lungs. But if it's mud, no matter how much you pump, not going to save him. So she saved the body, but could not save her daughter's life. It's freezing. It's like two, 2 degrees centigrade is what, 35 degrees Fahrenheit. The water is freezing. She almost died herself trying to save her daughter. What can we say? How can we understand when this happens out of the blue to 10,000 people like her? But the Japanese people have deal with this, not just last year, but for thousands of years. What's the wisdom that makes it possible for us to deal with tragic, unexpected death? The answer is, it isn't over. At butsudans, at grave sites, at familiar places, that we shared with them, we can feel their presence. Their body is not here, but we can hear their voice. We can feel them with us. We can listen to the wisdom and compassion of their lives. The man who introduced this to the West is a friend named Dennis Klass. And Dennis was a scholar from the University of Chicago. 
He came to Japan because his boy was working for an electronics company in Japan. And because he's a psychologist and religious scholar, he goes around to Japanese houses. And he notices Japanese people say, Ohayozams, good morning, to the altar. And they say, Itikimasu, I'm going out to the altar when they leave the house. If they got an important meeting or an important uh, engagement or omiyai or something, they pray, not pray exactly, but quiet their heart in front of the altar and say, Dad, Mother, what should I do at this meeting? What should I remember? What should I learn? And they hear the voice of their mother or father or the departed loved one before they go to the meeting or the omiyai or whatever. And then they come back after the meeting and say, thank you, it went well. This is what I learned. Thank you for staying with me. Dennis Class said, of course. Why are we wholly so stupid? We try to pretend like we didn't have any ancestors. We don't learn from our mother and father just because their body's gone. The Japanese know, the Chinese know, even when the body's gone, we can still learn from our family. If we don't still learn from our family, we're stupid. And he wrote some books he called Continuing Bonds. Continuing bonds means, while well, on this level, we have to use one cell phone to talk to each other. When they're on the other level, even Docomo and, and Verizon doesn't reach there. You've got to use a cell phone in your heart. But if you keep your heart cell phone charged up, you can still hear the wisdom of your family. Dennis Class has written a number of books called Continuing Bonds. He's been not a bestseller, but widely read and appreciated in the West. People say, yes, this is healthy. Stay connected to our families. And only by doing so can we overcome some of the tragedy of losing people all of a sudden. So today's theme, let's get academic. Wisdom and compassion at the end of life. The before, during, after. Can I make it any easier? Before is preparing our way. What can we do before we meet death? During is on those last days, and after is how we pick up the pieces. And medicine has given tremendous choices from keeping us on all kinds of machines, ventilated and artificially moving, even though we're no longer conscious, to Kevorkian kind of choices. You want to die, we got the machine for you. And our position is not to tell you what you should like. It's to help you find what feels right for you. It's a little bit of small print because there's a lot to do in preparing the way with wisdom. And this doesn't have to be done, it shouldn't be done alone, but rather in consultation with family and friends. Do we have one laser? Got one laser pointer. Oh, you just have to look. I, I'll point and you. We all have informed consent. That means we get to tell our doctors whether we do or do not want some procedure they're proposing. And we should choose one agent to decide for us if we can no longer communicate. This is so important because when you get demented or are in an accident and cannot speak, some of your family is going to say, do everything you can, doctor. Save him, save him. And other people in the family may say, no, he had a good life. Let him go naturally. And even after you go to the Pure Land, your family is still going to be fighting about, remember when you guys wanted him to go naturally and we wanted to keep him going and blah, 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 blah. Because you don't have a decision maker. If you choose your decision maker early, it could be your wife, your best friend, somebody you trust who knows your feelings, then if you get in that accident, or if your brain doesn't function the way it should, they become the trusted person. They do things the way you want, and the family doesn't get split out about what, you, what we should do. And there are lots of new decisions. Do you want your life prolonged? Or do you want pain control even if it shortens your life? 
Do you want forced feeding and forced ventilation, like the guy in the picture a few minutes ago? How about a heart massage? If you're young and healthy, of course you want a heart massage. If you're 90 years old and I massage your heart enough to get it going again, I'm going to break all your ribs. <laughs> not because it's me, but that's what happens. Your ribs are weak by 90 years old. A 90-year-old should not be getting a heart massage unless she really wants all her ribs broken in the process of coming back. So we have to choose things appropriate to, our, to our, our levels, our levels of consciousness, our levels of body. You want a blood transfusion, antibiotics? Antibiotics are good in many cases. They almost killed my father. He may die any day now because he's 90 years old. They gave him a course of antibiotics. The antibiotics called, killed all the good bacteria in his body, and now he cannot digest. So he had his entire guts cut out, talk about harakiri, and now he's living with an ostomy bag and dying with an ostomy bag because they gave him too many antibiotics. So in general, we think massage is good, antibiotics good, force feeding is good, but you've got to look case by case where you're at, what you want. And you can decide. You please decide. Otherwise, we in medicine have a lot of trouble knowing what you want and giving you what you want. You want to give your eyes or kidneys? You can do that after you're dead. Look at a fish eye. It stays clear for about three days after we catch them. Your eyes are good for three days after we catch you, after the pure land catches you. So we can still use your eyes for somebody else who cannot see. But you want to give your lungs, liver, heart. It's got to be done while it's pumping. We've got to cut out that beating heart if you want to give a heart transplant or a lung transplant. You want to do that, that's your compassion. That's fine by me. But I cannot say whether that is right for you or not. Only you know what you want to do. So before we get anywhere near dying, I hope and pray nobody will die as you walk out of here. But on the Pali Highway, people get into fender benders every day. Let's be prepared. We know we're going to go sometime. So let's get these directives in place. And the great people in Hawaii to do this are Kakua Mau. Kakua Mau has a table outside. Everybody in the state of Hawaii can register your wishes with the government so the police and the ambulance know what you want. This is coming into place in Hawaii now. If you don't have your advanced directives in place, and temples, both in Japan but also in Hawaii, can be a place to educate about this. I can't give you in the remaining 10 minutes all the information that you probably want about transfusions or organ doning, donating or whatever else. Each of these should take a long session with some questions and answers and some real examples and a video of what it looks like and all that. Where, sh where is that going to happen? Not going to happen in school. We're not going back to school anyway. Temples are the places we teach about life and death. And temples can do these workshops because they're helping us to live and die the way we want to be. Then we're dying. A lot of my dying patients say, Doc, why do I have to go on living like this? I'm lying on a bed. I can't do very much. There's no use in my eating anymore, my trying to walk anymore. And I ask, is there something that only you have still not finished, left to wrap up, something that only you can do better than anybody else. For example, a lot of people have not cleaned up their insurance and finances. And you know your finances and your insurance better than anybody else. If you don't know it, nobody else does. Put that in order, maybe you can get better treatment or treatment more like you like if you know exactly where you stand. Or you can decide where that's going to go. I asked my dying patient, anybody you want to say thank you to? And when we're not well acquainted, they say, nah. But a week later, they say, remember you asked me about thank yous? Well, in fact, there are a lot of people I'd like to thank. And sometimes we can put that on an IC recorder or a tape recorder, give those tape messages. If they're still strong enough to type, they can text some thanks to people. Or apologies. 
or reconciliations, making up. It's the last time for Nakanaori when you're on your last legs, but not too late to apologize to somebody you'd rather be friends with when you, when you go. There may be lessons. What you learned in life that you want to pass on to your friend or your grandchild. Labeling your photos. You've got lots of photos, lots of good memories. You know the people in those photos. Not everyone else does. So this is the time to put down their names and where this was and when it happened so your friends and your children, your grandchildren can appreciate your life. Because if you go without labeling that stuff, they'll say, gee, who was that in the photo? And where was granddad? And when did that happen? And we would like to know our family history, but he didn't label it. So we don't know. Video messages. In the old days, the family used to gather around as people were dying and listen to those last words, because last words can be very important. We respect that. But now it's hard for family to get together, because some live in the outer island or the mainland or Japan, like me, and try to come back for that last hour doesn't always work right. So what can we do? Take one video camera, tell the person, we will give you a special half hour, as long as you like. You give us your final message. And we'll put them on video so your family can save this forever. If we go into a butsuma, a, a room with the butsudan, we often have photos, black and white photos, with the black border of all of our ancestors. But now we can do it in live color and sound. And the great, great grandchildren aren't even born yet. We can show them this was your grandfather. And this is how he worked the cane fields, or this is how he worked his way up from Hotel Street. And because of his labor and his love, this is what we have become. This is a precious legacy that only you can tell the people who don't know your life. So there's lots to do. How about cleaning up your mess? <laughs> only you know where you want that stuff in your room. And you go from your room to your hospital, and when you're lying in the hospital bed, you say, what would you like to do in the end of life? A lot of people say, shimpenseiri, to clean up my, the last things. But I can't do my shimpenseiri, my cleanup, if I'm lying in bed. Oh, yes, you can, because we, from the temple, will help you. And with your permission, we can go to your room and photograph your stuff and ask you, what do you want to do with this clock or this photo or this whatever? And you can tell us, looking at the digital image on your hospital monitor, and then we can go help you put things the way you want them to be so you can be at peace when you pass. Giving possessions to those who might value them. And the important thing in possessions is not possessions. You go into one golfing store, or tennis store, or scuba store, or whatever, they got all the same gear, even better gear than you got. But the reason your gear is precious to you is because you used it, and you remember that tennis game, or that dive, or that bowling, whatever it was, and that makes your mask and your racket special to you. And if you no longer need them, when you give that racket or that mask or whatever to somebody who remembers that dive with you, that becomes special to them like nothing they can buy in a dive shop, because it's you, it's yours. But if you make that before you go, then everybody's happy. And if you leave your stuff until people have to clean up after you, it only has half the meaning. As if you said, I want this to go to my dive buddy. Make your funeral, make your grave meaningful. Funerals tend to be all the same color. The same thing in the same order, the same okyo, the same flowers. Give it your color. Put the flowers you like. If you like pikake instead of carnations, do pikake. If you like uh, Grateful Dead, maybe that's not so good for a funeral, sorry. <laughs> if you like Bon Jovi, put your flavor in your funeral. Only you now, and when you have your music and your flowers and your memories, then people come to your funeral and they say, yeah, that's him. I remember. We are together, brah. Temples can help in this. 
And then after, after you're gone, we, the Sangha, are left with your wisdom and your memories. And it's partly our job to reconstruct lives and relations. When the bereaved people are grieving our, our lost loved ones, and I've lost a few, we ask, how can I go on? And there are four steps. Rituals, talk story, chanting, and support groups. And temples are the place where this can happen. Rituals. Research shows that fewer secondary tragedies hit folks who repeat rituals of remembrance. That's Becker's local summary of an academic article in a medical journal. But let me explain. When people die on you, most people grieve, and in their grief, we get sudden illness, accidents, death, absenteeism, lowered functioning. In the worst case, we get depression and suicide of the people who are grieving. This is not unique to Japan or Hawaii. It's worldwide. But what some hospitals are finding is, before the person goes, you call together the loved ones. And after they passed, you have a ceremony at the first week, the first month, the second month. And if you have these ceremonies with the same loved ones, know what happens? They are immune to or relieved of suicidal depression, sudden illness, accidents, and death. In the old Japanese, we used to say, tatari. Tatari means the ghost from the other side going to get you. If you don't do the religious ceremony, that's why you got to go to temple, right? Well, I'm not so sure. It's not ghosts all the time. Maybe the reason people have more accidents is their heart isn't settled yet. Maybe the reason they have more sudden illness and sudden death, like my dad was totally ginky until my mother died, and within two months, he was on death's door. What hit him? His immune function went kapakaki. He totally lost it because he didn't know how to deal with the death of someone he had lived and loved for 64 years. But how can we get the immune function back? It's by these services. Services of family and friends coming together of support help put us back on track. The Japanese knew if you have memorial services, not just for the mumbo jumbo chanting, but also for the fellowship and for talking story about the person who's gone, that this tatari ghost stuff doesn't hit you. Your immune function doesn't drop, and you don't have fender benders. That's Japanese wisdom. Talk story. When I was researching in Taiwan about 30 years ago, Taiwan was just beginning a national insurance system like we got in Japan. And one question we asked a lot of people, 1,000 people in Taipei City, 1,000 people in the countryside near Aisha, uh, Ari Mountain. If you have a medical problem, you're going to go to Western medicine, Chinese medicine, or religion. And in those days in the countryside, about 40% go to each. Some people go to more than one, so we get a total 120%. In the big city, people don't go to Chinese medicine so much because the government did not pay for Chinese medicine at that time. I don't know if it does today or not. Most of them go to Western medicine. 80% move to Western medicine out of Chinese medicine. And it used to be 40% go religion in the country, 80% go religion in Taipei. And we thought, must be some problem. In Honolulu, the bigger city you get, the fewer people go to temple. How come these people go religion? So we did a follow-up survey. Why do you go religion when you're sick? And they said, well, when I go to a hospital, the doctor pokes something in me and looks at my tongue and takes my temperature and gives me pro one prescription, but he doesn't hear who I am, what troubled me. Well, I walk up the hill to the temple, and I talk to the sister or the monk, and she listens with a beautiful, smiling face, nodding, understanding. At the end, she gives me one small piece of Buddhist wisdom, not like Buddhism giving you lots of sermon. That's not the way to do it. 
one small piece that I need after I've poured my heart out and I felt healed. And we need this spiritual side of ourselves healed as well as prescription drugs. And that's what the temples in Taiwan are doing. You can't cure grief or heartbreak with a drug that takes listening. Buddhism teaches, I'm almost pow, suffering is caused by the gap between desires and reality. A Western culture says you solve that by changing reality. If it's too cold, put on a heater. If it's too slow, speed it up. If it's too small, what's the word in English? Supersize it. <laughs> Buddhism says, if you can't handle reality, get used to it. Adjust yourself to it. But how are you going to adjust to tragedy? If talking story doesn't do it, chant. Harvard University, in cooperation with the Massachusetts General Hospital, one of the biggest and most important hospitals in this country, is demonstrating these days that chanting is proven to reduce stress and enable acceptance. It's even better than sitting quietly in meditation, because when you chant, your hand is moving, your mouth is moving, you got no room for interference, like when is he going to call me or what I'm going to have for dinner. You're just totally into the chant. Don't get me wrong, chanting is not just a mechanism to overcome stress and accept reality. There's a lot of meaning, a lot of other stuff going on there that the temple has been telling you about for a long time. I don't need to repeat that. I'm not saying chant because it's good for you. But it happens to be good for you, so why not? Number four, caring and support groups. Help people find new meanings. In Japan, we have mochitsuki. People gather together after the earthquake, and people pull, the, pull their rice and try to talk story. And these support groups are so helpful. Stanford University was the first place to found that breast cancer survivors who had their lives pretty messed up and their bodies often messed up more than they needed to be came out of it much better when they had support groups of other cancer survivors. Project Donna here in Hawaii is a model for the world of support groups, of how the community can work together to provide the needs. Go Bows! Go Bows! <laughs> and when I've done surveys of what the elders in Japan want, where they want to die, they tell me they want to smell the soil, to hear the birds, to see the blue sky or the green forest. But unlike Hawaii, sad to say, we don't have much green forest or blue sky anymore. We're just too overpopulated. Well, where is the place in the big city where you can find a garden, blue sky, and birds singing? It's the temples. So by and by, not so many, but little by little, some of the temples are saying, OK, you can use one room to rest, to enjoy nature. You want to spend your day here? That's fine. Enjoy nature. Have some tea. Think about your life. We have the space. We have the nature. This is your home. Ekamomai. So. I'm Pau, fill in the blank. What can we do before, during, and after? This is not the end, this is the beginning. Thank you for having me.